Coming up on Market to Market. The highest court in the land rules on seed patents. It's deja vu for the House and Senate Agriculture Committees and a study to determine the right balance of cash and chemicals enters its third year. Those stories and market analysis with Sue Martin, next. Funding for Market to Market is provided by DuPont Pioneer, working with growers to match the right product to the right acre. Science with service, delivering success. This is the Friday, May 17 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Mike Pearson. Despite lackluster economic reports, a slower inflation rate served to push investors into action. Consumers opened their pocketbooks in April, moving retail sales numbers up by a tenth of a percent. The rise calmed those concerned that federal tax increases and spending cuts might slow economic growth. When the auto sector is taken out of the equation, retail sales were off a tenth of a percent. The Consumer Price Index, a measure of consumer goods and services, fell four-tenths percent this week, hitting a four-year low. When the cost of fuel is excluded, the so-called core CPI rose a scant 1.1 percent, the lowest in two years. This is below the Federal Reserve's 2 percent cap, allowing the independent body to continue its efforts to pump up the economy. The Dow Jones Industrial Average took the week to digest the news and hit all-time highs, closing above 15,350 on Friday. Part of the makeup of the trillions invested in the economy are billions put into research and development of genetically modified crops. What began more than a decade and a half ago as a curiosity has blossomed into a multi-billion dollar industry that comprises almost all of the commodity seeds sold in the United States. The sales of the new seeds came with technical agreements prohibiting the saving and use of any offspring. But there are always a few willing to push the envelope. And one Indiana man who believed the agreement had a limited scope found himself in legal trouble. This week, the highest court in the land rendered its decision. The U.S. Supreme Court upheld lower court rulings this week which favored Monsanto and protection of its patented Roundup Ready seeds. For several years, the agribusiness giant has disputed the actions of an Indiana soybean farmer. Vernon Hugh Bowman was a regular customer of the St. Louis, Missouri-based company, whose policy prohibits saving or reusing seeds once the original crops have grown. Under the contract, new Roundup Ready seeds must be purchased for each growing season. Once harvested and sold, the commodity seeds are intended for human or animal consumption. But for several years, Bowman took a late-season gamble and replanted a second crop using leftover seeds he bought from a local grain elevator. I just looked at it that when they dumped it in there, that they had abandoned their patent. They, you know, why wouldn't they have want it to be kept separate? If, if they want to protect their patent, then it looks to me like it would be required, they'd have be required to have to separate it at the elevator and keep it separate. In a statement, Monsanto's top lawyer responded to the verdict. The court's ruling today ensures the long-standing principles of patent law apply to breakthrough 21st century technologies that are central to meeting the growing demands of our planet and its people. The unanimous decree was also noted for its scope, which is limited to the case of Bowman versus Monsanto only. Court observers are quick to point out that no sweeping decisions were made about the intersection of intellectual rights and scientific modification. Parallels have been drawn between aspects of this case and upcoming deliberations on the high court's docket, which deal with genetic patents, regenerative medicine, and computer software. The annual right of spring for grain farmers is in full swing. While corn and soybean plantings are well behind last year, farmers are still waiting for Congress to pass what is now the 2013 Farm Bill. Planting decisions were made in the void that is an extension of the 2008 bill, but hope springs eternal. The third attempt at creating the nearly half-trillion-dollar five-year budget has been going on behind the scenes for some time. This week, both agriculture committees took up the legislation. Many of the compromises in the last versions of the bill remain. The one in seven who benefits from the alphabet soup of assistance programs are likely to see plenty of changes. In fact, nearly 80 percent of the money allocated for the omnibus bill is spent on those needing a helping hand. Meanwhile, farmers are caught in the middle. It's a political game that has gone from hide-and-seek to wait-and-see. 
the Senate Committee on Agriculture and Nutrition to order. We're here today, of course, to mark up our committee bill for the 2013 Farm Bill. Officially dubbed the Agriculture Reform, Food and Jobs Act of 2013, it is similar to legislation written last year that passed the Senate 327 days before this hearing, but later died without any floor debate. We saw last year undeniable proof that farming is the riskiest business in the country. The bill reflects fiscal responsibility, but provides a workable and strong safety net for families and producers of food and fiber that we hope they never need. However it stands today, I do not believe this is a reform bill. I believe it is a rear view mirror bill. Both bills claim victory in slashing spending, but from where the savings originate will likely cause the biggest debate. Iowa Senator Charles Grassley, a Republican, says the two pieces of legislation contain essentially the same language as in last year's version of the measure. The one thing that's bad in this bill that wasn't there last time is more leaning towards southern agriculture and moving back to something that we haven't had for the last 15 years, moving back to target prices for peanuts and rice. The meeting will come to order. House members spent a lot of time debating the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or SNAP, formerly known as the Food Stamp Program. Under provisions in the House version, a $2 billion annual savings would be created by eliminating automatic renewal of SNAP payments when recipients are signed up for other assistance programs. Both chambers remain deeply divided, but there are a few places where there is some agreement. Reductions in SNAP benefits would be made by giving higher food stamp benefits to those in states that pay lower amounts for heating bill assistance. Direct payments to farmers would be phased out for a savings of $5 billion annually. Previously, direct payments drew ire as payments were made every year regardless of crop price or yield. Federally subsidized crop insurance would receive a boost and a new program would be created to cover smaller losses on planted crops before crop insurance kicks in. The provision would favor Midwestern corn and soybean farmers who use crop insurance more often than most. Crop insurance critics argue administrative costs have tripled since 2001, with taxpayers subsidizing more than 60 percent of the premiums. Also, they contend the government is exposed to the cost of an ever-increasing amount of harvest price guarantees. And both of the bills would raise target prices for some crops. Certain subsidies would kick in if prices drop to specific levels, meaning farmers will only receive a payout if prices are low. Many of these subsidy programs have lain dormant for years because of high commodity prices, but remain part of the safety net for producers. A special provision in both measures favors peanut and rice producers through higher price targets. In the next three decades, the world population is expected to grow by 30 percent from 7 to 9 billion people. The challenge of feeding a burgeoning population on the same or potentially a fewer number of acres will be one of the greatest challenges faced by farmers in the future. The spirit of solidarity in facing a global challenge only goes so far when your closest competitor may also be your neighbor. But one agricultural group, whose goal is increasing profitability, is combining the efforts of several hundred farmers to find the balance between cash and chemicals. Paul Yeager reports. In the last 80 years, there has been a six-fold increase in U.S. corn yields. The gains are attributed primarily to better hybrids and the advent of chemical fertilizers. Weather, however, remains the key ingredient in agriculture's recipe for success, and in 2012, drought had a decidedly negative impact on the Corn Belt. USDA estimates a lack of precipitation caused last year's corn harvest to be nearly 20% less than the 2011 average of 147.2 bushels per acre. With corn at $6, even a two bushel per acre difference on a 300 acre farm can lead to a profit or loss of $3,600. While farmers can't control the weather, new technologies are enabling growers to maximize yields and minimize costs through the strict management of inputs. If we just assume we know what we're doing in a field, we can go out and very accurately apply the wrong amount of anything anywhere if we didn't know any better. 
Tracy Blackmer is the Director of Research for the Iowa Soybean Association, or ISA. Because the ISA's members raise soybeans and corn in rotation, the association funds over 30 research projects on both crops. Its goal is to find ways to increase yields and production efficiency while protecting the environment. You know, I don't know a farmer that wants to buy nitrogen that they're going to lose or don't need. But there's also a lot more regulations coming down to restrict how much you can apply. So the more we can collect more and more data, that will also have the impact not only improving management, but perhaps influencing future policy and regulations on fertilizers. It would really help everybody. It would help the environment. It would help the government spending and efficiency. It would also help the profitability of the grow. Thanks to yield monitors and GPS tracking, farmers can tell exactly what part of a field is producing well and where there is room for improvement. But those tools alone can't determine if more nitrogen is needed, where less nitrogen is needed, or if nitrogen is even a factor. It's more of trying to put the dollar of fertilizer in the right place in the field and do a better job. I don't, I don't want to put more on than what I need to grow that crop but I don't want to have a shortfall either. To find out how he might realize increased yields while reducing input costs, Ken Lund, who farms 2,800 acres in central Iowa, enrolled both a corn and soybean field in the ISA's Nutrient Management Benchmarking Survey in 2011. More than 400 farmers enrolled over 900 fields to have their soil and crops analyzed for essential nutrients and a number of micronutrients. Because the data was shared by farmers across the state, growers could learn not only what was right or wrong in their fields, but also in their neighbors. Growers aren't necessarily known for being neighborly and you know, their biggest competitors within 50 miles. This is a project that's going the opposite way. This is where growers are working together. They're collecting that data. They're all benefiting from it. They're increasing profitability on it. And I believe that's one of the, the real competitive edge right now for USI. The first step in the nutrient management benchmarking survey involved digital aerial imagery or DAI. Aerial photographs were taken of land enrolled in the survey to identify one non-stress and one target stress area in each field. Growers took soil samples and tissue samples from crops in each area so nutrient levels could be analyzed and compared. This field's been uh, continuous corn for six years now, and I'm interested to see what's going on a little more, and is pattern tiled. It has tile every 40 feet in it. I'm concerned with what that's doing to my nutrients. The soybean field was just a one of the representative fields of what I've got. It's a normal field. It's very representative of all of mine. The study allowed farmers to select the fields they wanted enrolled in the program. It also offered growers latitude in selecting program areas under the assumption that nobody knows attractive land as well as the person who farms it. When I went and took the soil samples and the leaf tissues, I did not go to a spot in the field where, that was real sandy where I'd have those kind of issues. I tried to stay in a representative part of the field where the nutrients are going to make a difference. As part of the program, growers met with other farmers in their area to compare notes, allowing participants to not only gain knowledge about their own farming practices, but to also gain insight as to what was or wasn't working for other farmers in the region. Since the study was statewide, it established a benchmark that will lead to a better understanding of how weather and soil types affect the uptake of macro and micronutrients. And there was the added benefit that it got growers out in the field taking tissue and soil samples, an important step towards better nutrient management. And we need to take the whole leaf and we need 15 of them. See? Like... If every grower did just one trial, in Iowa that would be over 40,000 trials to pick from. Most growers agree they can find at least one thing they can do better. But they're doing what they're doing because they think it's right or they wouldn't be doing it. How do you find that one thing better? So as we're getting down to the point of trying to fine tune within a few bushels for each management practice, we're finding out a lot of the stuff we thought 20 years ago isn't necessarily true today with better information.
For Market to Market, I'm Paul Yeager. Next, the Market to Market Report. A combination of weather, a stronger dollar, and thinner supplies made for mixed markets. For the week, July wheat lost 21 cents, while the nearby corn contract moved almost 17 cents higher. Soybean processors searching for supply pushed the July contract higher with a weekly gain of 50 cents. Nearby meal prices followed suit with a weekly move of $18.30 per ton. In the softs, cotton lost last week's gain and a bit more, falling 7 cents per hundredweight. In the dairy market, June Class 3 milk fell 36 cents, while the July contract moved 14 cents lower. Over in livestock, the June cattle contract lost $1.05, August feeders were off three and a quarter, and the June lean hog contract gained just over a dollar. In the financials, the euro lost 155 basis points against the dollar. Crude oil, after gaining almost 90 cents on Thursday, finished relatively flat for the week, losing two cents per barrel. Comex Gold declined by 72.10 per ounce, and the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index moved nearly three points higher to settle at 633.25. Here now to lend us her insight on these and other trends is one of our regular market analysts, Sue Martin. Sue, welcome back. Thank you, Mike. We mentioned at the top there, stronger dollar. We've seen the dollar getting up into a relatively high areas recently. Can you give us a little bit of description of what's going on there with the dollar? Well, I think part of it is is that the economy is viewed in the U.S. as being uh, better, that it's percolating along a little better. And um, investors, some of your a- analysts that are handling foreign money, are viewing the U.S. as a good investment haven right now. And so we're seeing investment money coming from in from overseas, going into our stock market, and also, of course, handing us dollars in doing so. And I think that's part of the reason the market keeps getting pushed up a little bit here at this time. The news here out of the U.S. seems to be good, and we're viewed as the less of all evils. Certainly. And now, after it's it's over 84, the dollar index is over 84, what does this tell us for the commodity market from that perspective? Well, normally, it would say that this kind of causes things to be more, commodities to be more expensive to the foreign buyer, and so therefore it can kind of slow up demand a little bit. And we're kind of um, having a problem with demand right now anyway um, for various commodities. Uh, if you're looking at the grains, for example, and production of soy and, and corn and wheat, well, it appears that world uh, stocks are going to grow o- over the next year. And expectation that the global drought that we were in this past year may change and we'll see good production in most countries this next coming season. And therefore, that's going to make it tougher for us to sell our commodities because we have to be competitive. And now specifically looking at overseas markets and U.S. producers, we're getting close to wheat harvest and the wheat price, even though harvest isn't looking great here in America, the wheat price keeps slipping. What are your thoughts on uh, nearby wheat? Well, I'm very friendly wheat, but it isn't, you know, gratifying me just yet. Um, I think the market's in a little bit of denial. Uh, It may have gotten propped up a little bit long going into the uh, quality wheat tour in Kansas. And now we're kind of correcting back. We're on a little bit of a seasonal slip where we're heading towards harvest, especially even for soft wheat. And so I think what's happening is, is that when the USDA came out in their last supply demand report and talked about the yield at 45 bushel to the acre, a little over 45, that seemed a little high. And I think that uh, with the Quality Wheat Tour talking about a 42 yield, uh, or actually it was 41.2, I think it was, it was just under the year before, um, that seemed even a little high at the time, and it may still come down. What we're going to have to do is prove it, and we're going to have to see come by and start rolling. And with the cold spring, it certainly delayed growth. Now with the heat moving back in, it's going to help us percolate along. But I think once we get in towards, um, well, I think by the 10th of June and even actually before that, I think we're going to have a low in place on this wheat and we'll be heading back higher. Um, I'm friendly to wheat, and I think Chicago wheat has a chance of swinging at $8. Just getting through harvest is the key, seeing well, what's coming off the yeah, combine. Yeah, um, coming off the combine, realizing that the crop isn't there domestically. Our stocks are going to be tight domestically. On the flip side, everybody looks at the rest of the world and says, well, you know what, we might have more out there than what we need. So, therefore, even though we're the largest exporter of wheat in the world, um, we may have to do a little bit of price competition. Sure. 
Certainly. Well, let's look at corn. And again, we've got the story between the old crop hampered by drought and the new crop still potentially looking at, at large acreage numbers there. Talk to us a little bit about what you see in old crop versus new crop corn. Well, the old crop right now, you, you're right. It's like two different markets. Uh, we have a big inverse that continues to grow. Uh, today, we've seen where there was um, a processor out of uh, Council Bluffs, out of Omaha, I should say, that was offering uh, 88 cents over July, uh, if you could deliver it by Monday for corn. And the rest of the month, maybe 83 cents over. So in, if a producer has corn in his bins and he's near ethanol plants, processors or whatever, he needs to be keeping an eye on this basis. Um, farmers are not selling corn. They're not even thinking about selling corn right now because of the fact that they're just busy getting their crops in and it's later than normal. And so they're a little concerned about that and they want to see that once the crop is in and get it all up, then start to take a look at what's going on weather-wise, and maybe then they'll start to part with it if it, we actually indeed have the crop out here. I think there's corn in the farmer's hands. I'm not so sure it's as aggressive as what the USDA thinks. The key is, how much did we really move from the new crop into old crop in 2012 that we maybe have the USDA overestimating our crop? We won't know that until we get more into June and possibly even into early July. The problem is with a producer waiting until July thinking he's going to cut a fat hog with a $2 basis or something over the board, it's going to be over December futures and because they'll roll out. And so he's going to see a little slippage. So we've been telling producers, take a look at this basis. If you're in an area where you've got tremendously good basis like that, take a look at it because you can garner 7 and 740 7 35 on your cash, that's not bad. Take so, advantage of it if yes. it's nearby. Well, let's look at soybeans real quick. Again, we've got that same spread, old crop versus new crop. What are your thoughts there? Well, I think that on the beans, first off, on both beans and corn, I'm still friendly on those markets. I've always been of the opinion that June was going to be a better time of the year uh, to make these sales for old and new. Now, the new crops are kind of giving me a little grief right in here, but it's not over with yet. And um, we may even slide into early July before we totally peak. But what I'm looking at is, is that the uh, old crop is in very much tight supply in the U.S. And the USDA has kept our carryouts the same for the past two months. But in the meantime, we're seeing exports percol percolate right along. We're just right under, I think we're around 99% of what the USDA, 99.2% of what the USDA had us targeted for, and we still have a lot of time to go. Now, the thought is that, yes, Brazil will be getting their act together and getting exports moving, but China's taking 70% of their exports. So, therefore, the rest of the world has to come to the U.S. for, for beans. And even today, we've seen export sales, um, I should say, on um, announcement for beans that were old crop beans, about 18,000 metric tons out of 138,000 metric ton crop sale to unknown destination. But... 18,000 of it was old crop. And then China was also in for a, a large amount, too, of new crop. So our sales are still percolating along. And when I look at beans, I think that uh, we're still, I'm still on deck for looking at June, possibly early July. But we want to be watching real closely because they're already starting to roll from July into November. Right. The November contract, I don't think I'd sell that with wooden nickels just yet. All right. Um, I'm very friendly, the new crop contract of beans. All right. Be patient, and it'll pay off. Well, I think so. Excellent. Well, let's talk. Let's move over to cattle real quick. We had the cattle on feed report out today. What are your thoughts there? How is that going to impact the market come Monday? Well, the cattle market has had such a hard down day on Friday. And it's also been kind of funky for the whole past week. Um, you have the uh, choice select cut out near all-time highs. And then you have the cash market, which did come in about a dollar lower this week at 125. But here we've got futures around 119, something. You know, we're just, there's a pretty good spread there. And at, normally, June is seen as a soft month. And our demand seems to be percolating pretty good, finally, now that we're entering into uh, a grilling season. It's been very late this year, and that's been part of our problem. The other part of our problem is, is that we continue to have to compete with the consumer's tax debt or disposable income mm -hmm. against beef versus pork and poultry. And we have a good supply, increased supply of pork this year and an increased supply of poultry. 
and therefore the cattle markets really had to struggle. And until we get the western uh, corn belt, areas where our pastures are in better shape, um, you know, who's to say that we're done because our cow slaughter has been increasing a little bit. That's right. Now, let's talk a little bit about the hog market. We did see a sell-off today. What are your thoughts there? How is that going to impact the market come Monday? Well, the hog market, I'm kind of leery of the hog market. Um, for one thing, let's look at China. You know, everybody's been thinking that our exports would really pick up and we'd be exporting. And China has increased their production pretty aggressively to where their prices are falling. And doing so at a time when the avian bird flu has created demand to step away by the consumer, you would think, well, they'll go and they'll switch to pork, but it doesn't matter, it hasn't held the price up. So they have overproduced their demand. Uh, the government has uh, set up a second round of reserve buying for their reserves, building up more reserves, just trying to support their prices. So obviously they aren't going to be importing pork. Um, Europe was thought to be, in the last half of this year, to be lower in production, and yet the USDA came out and showed world uh, supplies for this year to be higher than what we were thinking. Now this is kind of interesting because not only has U.S. markets been high the past year for corn and feed, but so has Europe and other parts of the world. And yet the producer didn't cut back his production. He stayed in there and even increased a little bit. Abnormal, very abnormal. And so this speaks to us that the prices are still going to wane here and probably move lower. Um, we're about seasonally ready to peak, I think. All right. Thank you so much, Sue. Thank you. Appreciate you being here. That wraps up this edition of Market to Market. But if you'd like more information from Sue on where these markets just may be headed, visit the Market Plus page at our website. You'll find expanded market analysis, audio podcasts, and streaming video of our program, as well as links to our Twitter feed and Facebook account, all free at the Market to Market website. Be sure to join us again next week when we'll examine further debate on the Farm Bill. So until next time, thanks for watching. I'm Mike Pearson. Have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa Public Television, which is solely responsible for its content. Funding for Market to Market is provided by DuPont Pioneer, working with growers to match the right product to the right acre. Science with service, delivering success.